What's up, college football fans? Sonoy Valencia here once again with the Mean Green Show. And today I'm joined by a returning guest, CJ Olson. He runs the fifth quarter SMU account on Twitter. And CJ, real quick, where else can we find you when it comes to all of our SMU content desires? Well, yeah, I mean, if you just, you know, first and foremost, got to look out for number one. So I'm just going to plug my own Twitter first and foremost. So that's right. That's CJ Olson 2000 on Twitter. If you want to follow me there, um, I've been, uh, I've been tweeting primarily from my SMU account, though, because SMU has been having a lot going on. So that you can find at FQ underscore SMU. Uh, If you're looking for SMU content, uh, that's where I would recommend finding it personally and as an unbiased person. Um, So, yeah, that's a. Oh, and then, of course, uh, my podcast at the RTP pod on Twitter or the Roughing the Passer podcast, wherever you get your podcast. We're going to get that started up again here in a few weeks uh, as the season is getting started. So, you know, big things ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, guys. And before we get into all things SMU, you already know the drill. If you're a fan of college football, G5 football, the transfer portal, or any of the above, consider hitting that like and subscribe button because that is seriously all that we talk about. All right, CJ, I want to get you fresh, fresh off of the the tweet. Earlier today, you tweeted out or you retweeted uh, something from college football, whatever. Did, did you guys name a starter? Did, is Tanner Mordecai the guy? Like, what, what's no, going no, no, on no, no, here? No, no. Okay. No, we're we're playing it coy. Um, you know, we got to make sure that we really keep it. Uh, I gotta find. I guess that. under wraps for when yeah. we, when we face the Wildcats of Abilene Christian. Can't give them that advantage. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Keep a program wrap. like that. Um, under wraps of the cats. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I personally, it feels like it's trending. Mordecai. Um, I think when I was last on your show, mm-hmm. I said that I felt like it was like sixty thirty five five. Yeah. I think now it's starting to trend more like 80, 15, five. Yeah. Um, and, but the thing that I do feel kind of happy with or like comfortable with is that I've heard a lot of good things about Derek green. Um, he's the longest tenured Mustang in that room um, that's seen the field at all. And so that kind of gives me some hope that let's say Mordecai goes down for a game or two stones already used up his four games and we want to redshirt him. Mm-hmm. I would feel comfortable like if Mordecai goes down with a stinger, I'd feel comfortable bringing in green for the remainder of the game. Like I feel like he's a very competent backup. And for all we know, he might, you know, sub in for the second half of a game and just be so good that it's like, well, we can't take him out. You know, we need to ride that hot hand. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have no idea what's going to happen. We have right. three very competent options at quarterback. That is a very, very presidential answer there. I, I, I got to give you some major props. I was trying to catch you and, Man, you took that with uh, you took that in stride, but thank you. Well, you know, I think I think we all know it's going to be Mordecai. I mean, UNT trying to mess everything up for you guys, uh, UNT fan that is, and uh, I, you know, I think we we all think it's going to be Mordecai, and that's a great that's a great option to have. Obviously, um, shifting gears, you know, a little bit away from the quarterback situation. There's a kind of a two headed dragon that I wanted to talk to you guys, talk to you about. And that's obviously recruiting and a big reason as to why the recruiting is as successful as is, from my opinion. And you may you speak on this as well is Coach Samples. So let's get into Coach Samples first. So, what exactly does Coach Samples do for you? What is the, his role as it sits now with SMU? Currently, I just consider him to be like the guy. Like he's, yeah. I mean, he's just great. Uh, mm-hmm. So, he his really is. Cool- his role right now is assistant head coach and running back, running backs coach. The year before, he was running backs coach and recruiting coordinator. And then the year before, at the uh, ripe old age of 24, was an on-field assistant, where he didn't have like he didn't have a room that he was, you know, in control of. He was just an on-field assistant. And then before that, he was an uh, an on-campus recruiting analyst or whatever with UT. Um, cause he was originally a four star mm-hmm. that went to Oklahoma state, uh, transferred to Houston, got hurt and medically had to retire. Mm-hmm. And then pretty much after Herman took the job, left from Houston to UT brought, uh, coach samples along with him. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's really been, in my opinion, the guy that like Jahari Rogers is a good example of, he's been a guy that's just about building relationships. I think that's what it's about that. He's very personable. He has a charisma that's not, you can't really teach it. I mean, right. it's its just kind of like a, a natural personability that 18 and 17 year olds relate to. And I think that's that's a an inherently valuable skill, like I said, that you can't just teach. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's, I guess to answer what his title is, that's what, uh, yeah, that's what he does. So he's an assistant coach and he's, he, he heads up the running backs, right? Yes. Yeah. Did you, I'm sorry. I, I don't know that much about him. I get, obviously is he, are you saying he's like 27, 28 right now? He's 26 currently. He's if I'm 26? Not he's 26. Yeah. And he is, in my opinion, three, maybe four years away from being our offensive coordinator. Now that's based on him nothing standing. other than like, yeah. I think coached because in the last three years to go from on-field assistant to assistant head coach, not only does that come with a, a name bump, I mean, that has to come with a financial sure. increase of, you know, not the highest order, but close to, um, it comes with a lot of, uh, just general day-to-day responsibilities. Um, and so I feel like those kind of combined show that the university is invested in him. They've invested yeah. a lot of time in that relationship. Right. And so he would be the guy who would be like, at the same time, I'm most concerned that he's going to get poached by say like UT cause UT's tried the, the last few years. Right. To, I don't know about this past year, but, the year or two before that, when Herman was still the coach at UT, they tr- pretty much offered him a, a, a big recruiting job. Mm-hmm. But he he wants to be a coach that recruits, not a recruiter that also coaches. That's the biggest thing for him. Right. And that's why he was such a big fan, I guess you could say, of the offer that Coach Dykes was giving him, is that mm-hmm. he was offering him an on-field position. That was the thing that kind of, I guess you could say, like tipped him over mm-hmm. and has kept him here. Nowhere else seems to want to give him because these coaches just have this archaic way of thinking of like, well, this is how it's always been done. He would be too right. young to be a coach. So we're just right. not going to let him do it. Right. And coach Dex has realized he's such a valuable asset and he's a great coach. Why would we, what, what does his age matter? If he's a good coach, yeah. he can coach, let yeah. him coach. Oh yeah, for sure. Dude. I had no idea he was 26. I thought he was like 30 something. No. That is so crazy, man, dude, that is nuts. He's going to set the record for the amount of like 30 under 30 lists he makes for 24 seven. Cause he's been making it since last year so he's definitely going to keep making it that is crazy well yeah enjoy him while you have him i guess because someone's got to come poach i mean he's just he's he's super valuable i mean look okay now going over to recruiting i mean you guys learn land jordan hudson best recruit in school history just to beat your previous year's best recruit in school history and preston stone in 2020 and then you come to to 21 and you guys obviously tee off with Jordan Hudson and that has to be a big part of, of coach samples. I mean, just building those relationships like, like you were speaking on what um, also just to st- keep it focused for that on a second here with the addition of um, Slade, Isaac Slade, Mata Tia, Ma, Mata Tia out of Oregon what is it that you guys have going on right now that you think is lightning rod rotting all these recruits to either transfer or you're winning battles over Alabama and Texas? Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things is we don't play games. We don't, there's this thing that most coaches do at the college level that I've never really understood. And that's, they offer, they make offers that aren't committable. They make offers that they don't really mean, but they want to make sure that they have them, on the back burner basically, but they do it so transparently to the point that the kids feel like they're not a priority. Whereas I feel like with SMU, we're very clear. Any offer you get from us is committable from the second we offer it to, you know, the second you choose to commit either to SMU or wherever you sign your national letter of intent. And so I feel like there's a certain like no games played attitude that really a lot of kids appreciate because it's a whirlwind, this recruiting thing. And like you see it, you know, now, especially that NIL has passed. I know we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but engagement and followers are the name of the game. And so getting those engagement numbers up when you're a high schooler is big. So like, you'll see like Jordan Hudson and a couple other, you know, guys that are in recruiting battles will post, you know, weeks after they visited, will post pictures from their visit because they know that there will be people that are like, Oh, you know, come to my school. Mm -hmm. But once you kind of get past that and you realize, okay, I need to now make a decision that's going to impact potentially the rest of my life Mm -hmm. at the very least, you know, the next 10 to 15 years, if I plan on trying to be a pro, it could impact that ability. And I think once they sit down and they realize, okay, where did I not feel like games were being played? Where can I feel like I'm going to find people that really, you know, have my best interest at heart. That's where that natural charisma and personability, like, I feel like there's just a certain genuineness that, 
most, if not all of the coaches bring. And I do think it's very telling if you look at the amount of people that transfer in versus transfer out of a program. I think that generally shows who's keeping promises, who's breaking promises. And generally speaking, the only guys that are leaving SMU are guys that are leaving um, because they're searching for more playing time, but they're not, they don't leave in like a bitter way. They generally leave with positive things to say, just that, you know, it just didn't work out. Right. Um, and so I feel like, I guess to sum it up, I mean, I feel like there's that genuineness that the coaching staff has that a lot of the high schoolers or transfers look at and they go, this is a place I want to be. You know, I, I kind of did the thing where I signed up for the big name program, but now I want to go to the right program for me rather than, you know, the right program based on name. So I think that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. I think that I think you worded that very gracefully and correctly. Do you want to go to the biggest program or do you want to go to the best program for you? I think that's, that's very well said. And, uh, you, you know, and obviously I'm a big advocate of G five football. I'm, you know, I think it's a good move for a lot of kids, maybe not SMU specifically just because of our dislike for wanting for one another. But, um, you know, I mean, how do you feel? I mean, I feel like it's a pretty good move by Jordan Hudson, though, even though I may not like it for whatever reason. But um, I mean, I just feel like the potential for him to get on the field and play meaningful reps quicker is what is just a more probability than, you know, going to Alabama or Texas. I and mean, do you think that factor factored into his decision and and whatnot? Uh, not primarily. I think secondarily, because I think if it were about playing meaningful, as you put it, snaps. Mm -hmm. And maybe with a playoff expansion with NIL, now snaps become more meaningful at a school like SMU. When you say it in that sense, the traditional sense of meaningful snaps, I don't think anybody would realistically, and you know, this hurts to say, I don't think anybody would go to a G5, mm -hmm. specifically with the idea of meaningful snaps in that traditional sense. And I very heavily want to make sure it's in quotes because yeah. I feel you know, when when you're watching the game and when you're playing in the game, those snaps are meaningful. For but sure. I think when we say meaningful snaps for a recruit, we're talking about ability to compete you know for a national championship and as the current system the four team system sits it's an invitational for power five teams so with that in mind then technically there are no meaningful snaps so i don't think in that sense um that's why hudson did it now meaningful snaps for nfl skills to see progression over four years maybe because a lot of times that's a knock of some of these prospects that aren't out of this world coming out of college that only played for a year or two is we only saw him do it for one year. Who knows, you know, what he looks like, how he progresses. We've only seen 12 games of film. Now it's Hudson's opportunity for 48 plus postseason, uh, however many postseason games of film to put out there potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's crazy. It, what a, what a crazy time. And you know, what about, what is Arch Manning doing visiting SMU? Do you have any idea how that went, how that laid out that he even came to visit you guys? Like, what do you know any of the ins and outs about that specific occurrence? So, Sanoi, I so actually, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I do know a little bit. However, I am not sure uh, personally how much I should give away. What I will tell you is it went well. Okay, it did not go to the point where I'm thinking like Arch Manning. You know, it, yeah, it was my understanding of it. It was probably the most unique pitch because we have to get a little different with it because we're not Ole Miss or Tennessee or UT or wherever else he's visiting. I don't know what his fifth school is. Alabama, anywhere, right. Yeah, exactly. So my understanding is they kind of had to get a little different with it and that he liked it. He really enjoyed the school. Um, and, you know, maybe we just go ahead. I have no idea if an expanded playoff would really help. Um, maybe if that got pushed through, then that would change. Maybe, you know, with the the Dallas market, if yeah. we allow Sherwood Blunt to come back, if he could finance uh, an endorsement deal to get him here, yeah. you know, maybe that's the type of thing that could get him here. I have no idea if that's part of it. Um, that's just me, you know, spitballing, hoping yeah. for the yeah. best. I mean, realistically speaking, it was good press. It, our name showed up about a five star. That's a top five recruit mm -hmm. on most sites. Yeah, a Manning. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, crazy. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's any knock on SMU if you don't land Arch Manning. I mean, obviously only one school is going to land him. But the fact that you guys were in you know conversations about that was pretty, pretty interesting and sickening for North Texas fans like myself. Um, so obviously name, image and likeness. 
you know, how, okay. And I haven't talked about this with anybody on the show yet, actually. So we're kind of breaking the ice in a little bit as it pertains, as it pertains to NIL. A, how do you think this is going to affect college football as a whole, G5 football included? B, do you think both of our schools are in pretty good? I mean, obviously you guys are in the heart of Dallas. That's a great market. Denton, you know, yeah, it's Denton, but Dallas and Fort Worth is everything, you know, everything's right there. Finger, fingertips away, essentially. So those two questions, A, how do you think this is going to affect college football as a whole? B, how do you think both of our schools fare from it? And yeah, we'll, we'll start with those two. All right. So how do I think it impacts college football? I have no idea. I mean, I think that it's, it's so hard to predict what 18 year olds are going to do. And it's so hard to predict the economy. And now we've tried to predict the economy of 18 year olds. I mean, it's people that are so insistent it's going to go horribly or people that are so insistent it's going to like save the sport, which it didn't need saving Yeah, is, I mean, those people clearly just, they don't know. I mean, they're just talking craziness for no reason. Um, One thing I will say is I was pretty firmly on board with passing NIL. I think that, um, I believe it was Justice Kavanaugh that said, like, in no other industry, regardless of, you know, like how the sport was set up or if you enjoy it because they're not getting paid in any other industry, that would not be allowed regardless of, you know, the enjoyment of fans. Um, and so I was kind of of a similar mind before that was an opinion expressed by the Supreme Court. I felt like it's only fair. Like, I have a podcast. If I want, if I get it sponsored, I don't lose the academic scholarship I have. And right. so I took issue with the fact that you know, somebody else that might have a podcast then can't monetize it if they're getting an athletic scholarship. And so I feel like uh, that's, you know, inherently unfair, but I don't know how it's actually going to go. Um, that's, that was never really my concern. I was more worried about what's right and wrong. Now, what I will say is that a lot of people were concerned that it was going to be like one specific or like a handful, a dozen people were going to make a ton of money And then nobody else was really going to see much of anything from it. Um, But the first person to execute a deal was actually an SMU linebacker. I wrote about it on fifth Mm -hmm. quarter. Uh, You can check it out. Uh, Jimmy Phillips, a linebacker who's played in 34 games and in those 34 games made 34 career tackles. So we're talking about a linebacker who's been more of a rotational piece for us. Now, this upcoming year, um, I mean, ISM coming from Oregon, that's just what I'm going to call Isaac Slade uh, or Matuatua. Yeah. Uh, Matatia, yeah, I butchered it earlier, but yeah, Matatia. Matatia, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that might uh jeopardize him being like a full time starter. He might still be a rotational piece. Um, even though he's a great tackler, on uh, a side note about Jimmy Phillips. Uh, you know, he was still the first one to execute the deal. I mean, I feel like that says something about uh, you know, that it's not just going to be the top one percent of college football. And today it came out that Miami, every they're giving 90 players uh, $500 a month. Uh, Some guy is giving to advertise that guy's MMA gym. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, I feel like that type of a thing is going to help because for college football, and I believe it was on the cover three podcast, they talked about like the bottom 50% of the roster in terms of talent scholarships really help because if you stack up the stipends they get every month, Mm -hmm. they could leave college with a free degree and, 10 to 20 or so thousand dollars in cash if you mm-hmm. live smartly right, uh, right if you live frugally and then there's the next 30 percent of guys that nil missing out on nil hurts them uh, a lot because they're not going to make the league most likely so they're missing out on that prime time that they could be getting paid money but it's still a pretty good deal for them all things considered and then there's the top 20 percent that are really I guess you could say just getting screwed out of money in those four years because mm-hmm. those people would drive a lot of money, but they're more likely to make the league. So on the back end of, well, not back end of their career, but you know, right. once they get out of college, they're more likely than to, you know, accrue a lot more wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I feel like for the, for the bottom 50% of the lineup or for the roster, I don't think this changes a whole lot unless we see a lot more deals like what, uh, Miami did, mm-hmm. um, or I know Nebraska did something similar. Um, I do think that, you know, even if it means an extra couple hundred dollars a month, like yeah. why not? I mean, I, I guess I just don't understand like the, the big issue. And I do think one of the things we're going to see 
is there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be some, I don't want to use the word a lot. There's going to be some issues in the next year and people that were anti NIL legislation are going to point to it and say, see, here's why we can't have this. Yeah. See, here's the issue. This guy forgot to pay his taxes. Why would we give this 19 year old all these resources freely? Like this is too much. We went too far the other way. We overcorrected. Um, and my stance on that is just that it's because for so long, the wrong, in my opinion, decision was made that now we've overcorrected. But if you give it a year, it's going to kind of course correct. I think eventually we're going to hit an equilibrium. I think there's going to be some big numbers thrown around in this next upcoming year. And maybe a couple of the top recruits are going to sign six figure deals. But on the whole, I don't think it's going to change too much because at the end of the day, most of the programs don't turn a massive profit. Now, a lot right. of it is sometimes they have to spend on these extravagant upgrades that aren't necessarily like needed, but they can't turn too much of a profit because, you know, they're universities. They can't be, you know, a for-profit university if, if they're bringing in that much money. Um, so overall, I don't think it changes too much. I think that it's going to change some things for those guys in the middle. It's going to bring in an extra few thousand dollars a year, which I think is completely reasonable that given the long-term health concerns of playing football, like I believe playing high school football only is somewhere between like 15 to 20% of long-term uh, head injuries or brain, you know, CTE type mm -hmm. stuff. But then mm -hmm. when you get to college, that's when it kind of like then gets to another level of like the gap between high school and college long-term concerns is a lot bigger than the gap between college and the NFL. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, at least to just on principle to allow them to make money while they're enduring that risk. Um, I think that's good for the sport. Yeah. Piggybacking off of that, as far as it pertains to SMU and as well as, you know, North Texas, TC, you know, all the schools around here. I mean, yes, I think, I think you, what you said, I, I would agree with, you know, it's not going to change the game completely, whatever. But I mean, there is, you know, I mean, I think kids will factor that in some like, well, what kind of market is this school located in? And do you think it will play an advantage to us being in the Metroplex, which is a very, oh, yeah. very nice market? I mean, just that's just facts uh, as opposed to, you know, I'm not trying to throw shade, but like Tulsa or something, you know what I mean? I'm just like, okay, then I mean, that's, you know, where, where would you rather shine at from a, from a monetary standpoint? You know what I mean? Do you think it'll affect schools like, you know, what we represent, you know, to some extent, if, if any at all? Yes, to an extent. Mm -hmm. There are so many big name boosters at schools in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Especially in this area. I mean, they're going to be guys that got rich off oil in the 80s and 90s that didn't go to Tulsa because they were looking to make a ton of connections and then they just happened into oil or maybe mm -hmm. they were even smart about where to find oil and then they just you know, they're super rich. I mean, I don't think it's uh, necessarily easy to say like, uh, like a school like Alabama, they have plenty of big name boosters, but like mm -hmm. I've been to Tuscaloosa. There's not a whole lot there outside yeah. of the university. I've been to right. Auburn. There's not a whole lot there. They're still, oh, I mean, yeah. they're still going to have the money to throw around. So to say, I mean, there's more opportunity. Like I was talking about those guys in the middle, there might be a little bit more opportunity for those guys in the middle to make money in the Metroplex. I don't think it's going to be as drastic as people say, because like, I have no idea about Utah State's alumni situation. I'm sure there's a billionaire or a mm -hmm. hundred millionaire or a 10 millionaire at least that is a fan of the athletics. Like at every school everywhere, regardless of the situation, there's going to be a wealthy person just based on how many people, you know, are graduating from these universities every year, you know? Yeah, yeah no, you're right. Um, what about schools like, like UT though, are you, I mean, are you scared that like, this is what I'm kind of concerned with. Can somebody who owns a restaurant or somebody like some very wealthy person kind of parlay a message to a recruit of like, Hey, if you come here, you're going to get X amount per month for NIL, you, you know, uh, for marketing or whatever. I mean, can you foresee anything like that? Like as far as, you know what I mean? I mean, just like, People yeah. that, you know, represent or, you know, want to see that school do well, just essentially like, hey, we'll, we'll pay you X amount. If you get a, if you don't get a higher offer, you know, kind of kind of come here, you know, I mean, do you think that will happen? Is that like inevitable? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, because that's that's we've pretty much we've opened it up to the free. We've connected the free market of college recruiting and 
I guess, college athletics. We've yeah. kind of linked these to now economically speaking. So now there's going to be an interest. And you mentioned UT as a concern. UT has been at the top of the, the talent charts for the last, you know, five years. I mean, they've been right. towards the top anyways, just like Georgia. And they both have zero national championship championships to show for it. So when I think that a lot of time people are making mountains out of molehills on this one, um, I do think there are going to be some big schools that say, Hey, we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars a year to do commercials for our restaurant contingent on the fact that you're still playing for insert school. Right. And that's just going to happen. I mean, right. there's at least now the businesses are getting some sort of benefit from it. I mean, I watched, yeah. I watched a uh, pony excess this morning, uh, the 30 for 30. Great. I would recommend it. And they talked about an SMU recruit that SMU went down with a briefcase of 20 grand to this recruit that was uh, committed to A&M and was like, does this change your mind at all? And they were like, coach, you're not even close. And that guy didn't even have to do a commercial, like yeah. a bogus commercial. So like, I do think that there's, go that's it definitely going to happen because can we say definitively that that's not already happening without the sham commercials at some of these big places? Yeah, no, I can't say, I mean, I can't promise it's not happening at some of those bigger programs for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it'll just, now it'll just be more legal, I guess. Um, all right. So last, last little bit of SMU information I want to get from you before I let you go is your guys schedule. How do you, how do you feel about it? And can I get, can I get some sort of prediction from you as far as record goes? Okay. So I hate our schedule okay. just flatly. I mean, they did us no favors. I would challenge you to find in the G5 six a six a, a harder six game stretch than Tulane, Houston, Memphis, UCF at Cincinnati, Tulsa. Mm -hmm. I mean that is a stretch straight out of hell. Uh mm -hmm. especially given the fact that in the last two years our November record is like at five hundred or yeah. just below five hundred. I mean mm -hmm. we ha we haven't really finished years strongly and that's been something the staff has pointed out. That's not just like kind of like murmurings of the forums like right. Kinda, right. I guess you could say like nonsense. Like it's it's murmurings actually, of the forum. I love it. The dark the web. <laughs> exactly. It's not like some like, you know, behind closed door conversation and people like, Hey, have you been noticing this happening? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have. Like, this is something that like coach Dykes has come out and said like, yeah, we've been struggling to close. That's like a, a, a point of emphasis this year is making sure that we close out well. And so like when I look at the beginning of our schedule, like Abilene Christian, UNT at Louisiana tech at TCU, USF at Navy, and then bye week so those first six weeks, I think we're looking at five and one or six and oh. I don't know where that one would come from. I mean, I'm a little worried about Louisiana Tech. Yeah. Um, TCU, I think Max Duggan is a lot better than when we saw him in like his third career game and or in his second career game in 2019. Um, UT got some players too now. We, we hit the portal. We got some guys, but yeah. Yes. Keep going. Yes, you yeah. did. Yeah. Um, that being said, I do think we beat y'all. Yeah. Um, and then at Navy, is it's always tough to, t uh, it's always tough to travel to Annapolis, but we're not playing them on senior day, which is really the big issue because they're like almost undefeated on senior day in the last 20 years, but otherwise they're not, uh, you know, all that tough. Um, but then this, this, uh, end of the end of the season. And I wrote about, uh, this on fifth quarter, pretty much that the, the schedule makers did us no favor because like Memphis has a bye week before we travel there. Cincinnati mm -hmm. gets an extra day off before we go there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's those little things that don't mean a whole lot to like when we just look at it in a macro sense. But when we're actually like when the players are actually getting ready for the games, that type of a thing matters uh, on a week by week basis. Um, one thing that I did like is that we have two mini bye weeks almost because we have the bye week on October 16th and then we host uh, Tulane on a Thursday. So we kind mm -hmm. of get like nine days off or I think it's 11 days off and then eight days off. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, you know, a full yeah. thing, but I'm pretty sure Tulane also has a bye week that week before. So it's like, even when they do us a favor by giving us like this cool little scheduling thing, they also then go and give it to Tulane. And it's like, well, so pretty much wherever a team could have a bye against us in that toughest part of the schedule, they do. Mm -hmm. And then wherever we could get some benefit from it, we don't get any benefit in the end because they end up getting a similar benefit. I mean, the only thing that I kind of like is that we get UCF at home. I think it would be really tough, uh, really, really tough to travel. I don't know why I keep mixing up tough and travel. It'd be really tough to travel uh, to UCF after also traveling to Memphis uh, and Houston. 
and then Cincinnati the following week. I mean, that would be a really tough stretch. Um, so it's just that back half of the schedule worries me. Like we could be six and zero, and then finish eight and four, and that wouldn't surprise me. Or we could be six and zero. We build off that momentum, and we say, "Damn those torpedoes, full steam ahead!" And you know, we go fourteen and zero yeah. with your six bowl win. I mean, who's to say? Yeah. And that's the beauty of college football. You never know, you know, I mean, you really never know, especially with the, with the transfer transfer portal thing, how drastically teams can change in one year's time. Oh yeah. You know, it can. Um, and you know, that's why, you know, this year's a pretty big year for UNT kind of make or break for uh, coach Latrell. A lot of us believe. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm hoping we have a surprisingly good year and we can keep them. And if not, then maybe we, co- we, we come and poach coach well, samples. Well, um, no, that I don't give you permission to do that. But <laughs> I, I do like I do like Ani. I think that he's uh, he's poised to have a pretty good year. Um, I think that him and him and Bailey Zapp right now are two guys, two quarterbacks in the conference USA yeah. that I like to be first team conference USA like kind of sleepers. I mean, not yes. so much Zapp. I think people know about him because mm-hmm. um, of what he because he put up some gaudy numbers. Yeah. Oh yeah, Baptist. But I think people are sleeping on Ani a little bit. So yeah. I definitely do think y'all will be better this year for sure. Yeah. Well, I you know I. Hoping you're right. You know, we also got Jace Reuter coming in uh, out of North Carolina. So we'll see, you know, may the best man win that job. And, you know, hopefully we'll have a quarterback that we stick with for the, for the, you know, the blunt of the season other than, mm-hmm. you know, not like last year, but well, alrighty, CJ, you know, once again, I appreciate your time. Anytime. And, uh, yeah. So thank you for coming on. I look forward to doing it again.